Okay, so this plasma membrane is in yellow, and just outside of that is the cell wall in red. Though the bacterial cell wall is rigid and sturdy, it is also extremely porous. It lets nutrients in, it lets enzyme pass through, so it is not a source of chemical protection. What the cell wall does is provide sturdiness and protection against physical pressure, such as osmotic stress. Osmotic stress has to do with the movement of water, right? So water can move through the plasma membrane towards areas where solutes like sugars and salts are the most concentrated. Um, bacterial cells are always hypertonic relative to their external environment, meaning they have more solutes inside than there are outside the cell membrane. And this means that water tends to rush into bacterial cells, which would cause them to burst with high osmotic potential, except that the cell wall protects against this, preventing the cell from expanding too much with water. So if you don't remember the concepts of osmosis, I, I ask you to please review that as well. So that's another um, concept from your prerequisites. So osmosis, we just talked about diffusion. Osmosis is diffusion, but it's the diffusion of water. So water also moves down its own concentration gradient from areas of high water concentration to areas of low water concentration. Now, we often has, have trouble figuring out you know, what does that mean? What does it mean when water is highly concentrated versus where water is less concentrated? Because usually we're thinking of water as the white space behind the solutes. But the truth is that water is made up of molecules as well. So the more water co molecules you have in a specific air space, the more concentrated the water is. So if you have salt water and you have fresh water, the fresh water is going to be a higher water concentration because there's no salt taking up any of the water space, right? So if you think about salt, how salt molecules take up space and water molecules take up space, in, this, in a glass of salt water, you have fewer water molecules because the salt molecules have displaced them. If you have the same size glass of fresh water, the water is going to be more highly concentrated because it's all pure water and there's no salt molecules taking up any of that space, right? So water moves down its own concentration gradient uh, from areas of high to low water concentration. But one way to remember that if it's difficult to, you know, sometimes it feels like we're thinking of the inverse of diffusion when we think about osmosis. Um, you can just remember that water follows solute. So water is going to move towards the solute because that's where water is less concentrated. Okay? So water moves towards sugar. Water moves towards salt. Um, so, so like I said, bacterial cells are always, they're pretty much always hypertonic relative to their external environment, meaning they have more solutes inside their cell than there are outside the cell membrane. So that means water tends to rush into bacterial cells, which would cause them to burst from osmotic stress, except that their cell wall protects against this. The cell wall prevents the cell from expanding too much with water. Without the cell wall, a bacterial cell will burst like an overfilled water balloon. Cell walls are composed of a molecule called peptidoglycan, and peptidoglycan is a molecule you have to remember. You don't have to remember its you know, chemical structure, but I'm going to show it to you here. Peptidoglycan is made of a couple of different types of sugars. It's a disaccharide, meaning one peptidoglycan molecule is made up of two sugars strung together. Um, you don't have to remember the names of these sugars. I just want you to remember that it's a, a peptidoglycan has a sugar backbone, a disaccharide backbone. Um, and then these sugar backbones are, the sugar backbone is linked together in chains by proteins. So the sugar chains are cross-linked with amino acids. So here's this long chain of sugars, and then those chains of sugars are cross-linked by these uh, amino acids or proteins. So the amino acids are these little tiny proteins or peptides hold the peptidoglycan together in sheets. So first you have these strings of carbohydrate, and then many of these strings are held together in rows by cross-linking proteins, and then those are held to, those create sheets. And then those sheets are stacked, and those stacked sheets of peptidoglycan create the cell wall. Okay? So many peptidoglycan sheets are layered on top of each other to form the cell wall. Um, there is something called a gram stain, which you will do in your micro lab, which is the, the gram stain is purple. And that purple stain is trapped by peptidoglycan. So you can see the bacteria. Now, gram positive bacteria 
are bacteria that retain this purple gram stain. And the reason they retain the gram stain is because they have extremely thick cell walls. Gram-negative bacteria are bacteria that do not retain the purple gram stain because their peptidoglycan cell walls are quite thin. So what you do with, to, to, to differentiate gram-positive bacteria, so there's a reason that you'd want to know whether a bacteria is gram-positive or gram-negative. And that's because uh, it, it dictates what drug you use to treat the infection. Okay? So gram-negative infections have to be treated differently than gram-positive infections, and we'll talk about why in a moment. So you really want to know, is this a gram-positive bacteria or a gram-negative bacteria? So what you do is you add the gram stain and then you wash it off. Well, gram-positive bacteria, which have an extremely thick cell wall, it doesn't wash off. So those bacteria stay purple. And here and you can see in this diagram, with gram-negative bacteria, which have a very thin cell wall, the gram stain does wash off and they're left appearing pink. Okay? So when you use a gram stain, you are determining whether the bacteria under your microscope have a thick or a thin cell wall. Because bacteria would fill with water and burst like an overfilled water balloon without their cell walls, peptidoglycan is the target of common antibiotics. We've already talked about where penicillin comes from, from the fungus penicillium. So let's talk about how it works now. Penicillin is one of several drugs called beta-lactam antibiotics. It's a whole family of drugs, and all of, of antibiotics, that is. And all beta-lactam antibiotics interfere with bacterial cell wall construction. So basically, there's this enzyme called transpeptidase, and transpeptidase links the strings of peptidoglycan together. Beta-lactam antibiotics disable transpeptidase by binding to its active site. So basically what they do is they, they gunk up the enzyme. They gunk up the active piece of that enzyme so that enzyme can no longer build the cell walls. They can no longer you know, cross-link those sheets together. This means in the presence of beta-lactam antibiotics, like penicillin, cell wall synthesis stops and the cell lyses or bursts from internal water pressure. So the, you know, without the cell wall, water will, you know, keep rushing, there's no barrier anymore to how much water rushes into the cell, and it just overfills and it bursts from water pressure. However, penicillin resistance is now common. Um, I'm going to show you some clips from this video which explain how mutations in the transpeptidase enzyme can result in resistance to beta-lactam antibiotics. And I'll, I'll show you the visual through the video, but very briefly I'll explain that you know, when this enzyme transpeptidase is mutated in, in a certain way, it, it changes shape. And that change of shape makes it so that beta-lactam antibiotics like penicillin cannot fit into the active site of that enzyme. So they can't gunk it up. So the enzyme changes shape in such a way that the, the penicillin or whatever can't, other, the penicillin or some other anti uh, beta-lactam antibiotic can't fit to gunk it up. But the shape hasn't changed such, so much that it can no longer do its job. It still can do its job. Now, it may not build cell walls quite as well as the original version, the non-mutated version of the enzyme, but... And so without, if no penicillin is around, the mutant transpeptidase is not as good as the original transpeptidase. And this is why antibiotic resistance isn't favored unless there's antibiotics around. Because in, a, in an antibiotic, in an antibiotic free environment, those mutant bacteria that have that altered transpeptidase enzyme are worse off. They're still building cell walls, but they're not as good at building those cell walls, so their cell walls aren't constructed as well, perhaps. Now, if you fill a person's body with antibiotics, and that person happens to have some of these resistant mutants with mutated transpeptidase, those are going to be the only ones that survive. They are building cell walls. They do have cell walls. They weren't as good cell walls as the original versions, but they do have cell walls, and now they're the only ones that survive because they're the only ones that don't get gunked up by, by the antibiotic. Once in the periplasm, the peptidoglycan precursors bind to cell wall acceptors and undergo extensive cross-linking. Two major enzymes are involved in cross-linking, transpeptidase and D-alanyl carboxypeptidase. These enzymes are also known as penicillin-binding proteins, 
because of their ability to bind to penicillins and cephalosporins. Eventually, several layers of peptidoglycan are formed, all of which are cross-linked to create the cell wall. Gram-positive bacteria may have more layers than gram-negative bacteria and thus have a much thicker cell wall. Beta-lactam antibiotics include all penicillins and cephalosporins that contain a chemical structure called a beta-lactam ring. This structure is capable of binding to the enzymes that cross-link peptidoglycans. Beta-lactams interfere with cross-linking by binding to transpeptidase and D-alanyl carboxypeptidase enzymes, thus preventing bacterial cell wall synthesis. By inhibiting cell wall synthesis, the bacterial cell is damaged. Gram-positive bacteria have a high internal osmotic pressure. Without a normal rigid cell wall, these cells burst when subjected to the low osmotic pressure of their surrounding environment. As well, the antibiotic penicillin binding protein complex stimulates the release of autolysins that are capable of digesting the existing cell wall. Beta-lactam antibiotics are therefore considered bactericidal agents. If this remodeled DNA segment codes for cross-linking enzymes, i.e. penicillin binding proteins, the result is the production of altered penicillin binding proteins. These altered penicillin binding proteins can still cross-link the peptidoglycan layers of the cell wall, but have a reduced affinity for beta-lactam antibiotics, thus rendering the bacterium resistant to the effects of penicillin and other beta-lactam agents. Bacterial cell walls are great targets for antibiotics because, one, they are essential to bacterial survival, two, all bacteria have a peptidoglycan cell wall, and three, only bacteria have a peptidoglycan cell wall, which means that if you take a drug that poisons a bacterial cell wall, it will do absolutely nothing to damage your own cells, since your own cells do not have any such thing. In addition to some antibiotics targeting the bacterial cell wall, we produce a few antibiotics ourselves. For example, there's this enzyme called lysozyme in our tears, sweat, saliva. Lysozyme breaks apart the peptidoglycan backbone of the cell wall. So those three features are the things you, you know, people who synthesize antibiotic drugs need to think about. You know, that's what, that, that's what the ideal antibiotic would do. Uh, they would target a feature that, one, is essential to bacterial survival, two, that all bacteria have, and that three, that only bacteria have. So I told you that gram-negative bacteria do not retain gram stain because they have a thinner peptidoglycan layer. But this does not mean they are weaker than gram-positive bacteria. It's actually quite the opposite. Because remember I said that the peptidoglycan layer, it, it's protection against osmotic stress, against bursting from overfilling with water, but it's not a chemical barrier. It's not a shield. No, the, the cell wall is not a shield. It's just structural support. Gram-negative bacteria, instead of having a thick cell wall, they have an additional membrane called the outer membrane, which is impermeable to many drugs. So some beta-lactam drugs, such as penicillin, do not work well against gram-negative bacteria due to this protective outer membrane, which does not allow the antibiotic to enter or to reach the cell wall. So though gram-negative bacteria have a thin cell wall, they are actually harder to kill than gram-positive bacteria. Remember that the cell wall provides structure. It's not a shield. You can think of it more like scaffolding. You wouldn't put up scaffolding to protect your home. You'd put up a wall. The cell wall is scaffolding. The outer membrane is more like a protective wall. So the, gram -negative, the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria is a shield. So there's some features on this diagram that I want to show you. So first, this bottom layer is the phospholipid bilayer that all cells have. That's the cell membrane. Then in purple, you have this uh, cell wall that's thick in the gram-positive bacteria and thin in the gram-negative bacteria. 
Another feature of the cell wall in gram-positive bacteria is it has lipotechoic acid. And I'm not going to test you on lipotechoic acid now, but I ask you to note it because when we talk about the immune system, this is going to come up again because it's a, it's a chemical, it's a, it's a bacterial molecule that our immune systems respond to. And then this outer membrane is made up of phospholipids on one side and lipotechoic, or excuse me, and um, uh, LPS, so lipopolysaccharides on the other. So it's not, it's not symmetric. So it's phospholipids that you're familiar with on the bottom and uh, lipopolysaccharides on the top layer. So that's that outer membrane. And LPS is something that I also need you to remember. So lipopolysaccharide, it's labeled here. Lipopolysaccharides on this top side of this outer membrane, that is also a, a bacterial molecule that stimulates an immune response from you. So the outer membrane provides extra protection from the environment because it is a molecular barrier. Like the cytoplasmic or cell membrane, it is filled with protein channels which give the membrane selective permeability, controlling what gets in the cell and what gets out of the cell. It's also asymmetric, as you'll see again in the next slide. So one side of the outer membrane is composed of the normal phospholipid, phospholipids familiar from the cytoplasmic membrane. The other side of the outer membrane is made of, up of lipopolysaccharides. And you should remember lipopolysaccharides, LPS, like I said, because they come up over and over again in, in the course. Uh, they're going to be especially important when we discuss immunity because our immune systems recognize LPS and lipotechoic acid of gram-positive bacteria, and it responds to them with inflammation and fever. So lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, it just means that there are sugar chains, polysaccharides, attached to the lipids. So if we go back to this little diagram, we had the plasma membrane in yellow. We've covered that. We've covered the cell wall in red. And this bacteria doesn't have a, an outer membrane. This tells you that it is a gram-positive bacteria. Uh, because only gram-negative bacteria have cell, have outer membranes. And then, so instead of an outer membrane, this bacteria has a capsule, and we will cover capsules next. So capsules are made of the substance called glycocalyx. Glycocalyx is sticky, and it helps bacteria stick together in colonies or to stick to other things like a human cell. When glycocalyx is organized and firmly attached, it's called a capsule. When it's disorganized and loosely attached, it's called a slime layer. Slime layers are involved in biofilms, which we discussed in chapter one. So when we talked about biofilms and bio crusts, those are all created by this slime layer version of glycocalyx. So capsules are made of glycocalyx, and they are also important virulence factors, meaning they help cause disease. They not only help the bacteria attach to human cells, but they also prevent our immune cells from ingesting and digesting them. So you have immune cells that go around gobbling up all the pathogens, but a capsule is large, um, and it has these chemical features that make it almost impossible for those immune cells to gobble them up. Glycocalyx, when loose and disorganized, helps to form biofilms, which are films of bacteria that stick together. Biofilms help bacteria communicate and cooperate, and they are involved in 80% of infections. So maybe the most, perhaps the most famous place that you see them is in UTIs. So when you have a urinary tract infection, what's happening is that the, uh, th there's this film of E. coli in various parts of the urinary tract. And so, uh, and, and those, if you let a UTI go for too long you know, without treatment, those biofilms can get so thick that they're hard to penetrate with antibiotics. And that's another way that they're protective to the bacteria. So you can take antibiotics and it'll kill this top layer of the biofilm, but, but it won't be able to, you know, if this layer, if this biofilm is super thick, that antibiotic won't be able to penetrate the bottom layers. And so once the course of antibiotics is done, you still have this thinner layer of this biofilm from the bottom that was protected by the top and they can grow back. So if you let a UTI go too long, it be can become a recurrent UTI for that reason.
Another place you see biofilms is, you know, patients that have uh, catheters or other types of hospital equipment that are in, you know, trachs or something like that, or if they're intubated. Those kinds of medical equipment that stay in the body for long periods of time, you'll notice you have to clean them often because they get the slimy layer of them, and that's caused by a biofilm. That's this glycocalyx, which is a colony of bacteria.